1633, Charles uh, appoints uh, William Laud as Archbishop of Canterbury, the highest religious office uh, in the Church of England. Laud was not liked by the Puritans, nor was he liked by Protestants in Scotland. Remember, because the kingdoms are united, right? there's one ruler. And so the Scottish begin to revolt against England. Now remember, during this time, Parliament has been sent home. So if Charles wants to fight this fight against the Scottish, he needs to call Parliament back to get the funds. So he calls them back in April 1640 to fund this war. And Parliament says, no. Right? And they absolutely refuse uh, to do what the king wants, and so he dissolves it again in a matter of weeks. <laughs> Hence, it's called the short part. Right? It's only in session for just a few weeks. Things continue to get problematic between Charles and Scotland, and so in November of 1640, he calls them again. Well, Parliament isn't just satisfied in telling Charles they are not going to give him the funds. Instead, this time, they arrest the Archbishop of Canterbury. They try to impeach the Queen, which causes Charles to try and arrest members of Parliament, and civil war erupts. Eventually, Charles is captured by Parliament's forces. He tries to negotiate his position, but is charged with high treason and beheaded on January 30th, 1649. Around the same time, Parliament passes an act essentially abolishing the office of king. There would not be a monarch to succeed Charles I. Now, if you know anything about England, you probably know at least they have a queen. So something has happened between then and now that brought the monarchy back. But for a time, there was a protectorate rather than a monarch. And so this interregnum between the reigns, between the reign of Charles I and his son, Charles II, there is a protectorate. So leadership passed to a man named Oliver Cromwell, who was a Puritan. He becomes Lord Protector. He too has problems with Parliament, even though Parliament is, uh, is Protestant, and so he dissolves it as well. Even though he's Puritan, he's also relatively tolerant, and so a variety of denominations flowered during this period. Uh, a lot of the ones that we think of as, as major ones, like the Baptists. Cromwell died in 1658, and his son Richard was selected as Lord Protector, but he fails to hold on to power, and so Parliament decides that even though it's only been nine years and the kingship had been abolished, that they're going to go back to a monarch. So Charles, the son of Charles, who had gone to France uh, during the Civil War, is called back to become Charles II. This period of time is referred to as the Restoration, because of the restoration of the kingship. A couple of things that are important from Charles' reign, uh, as far as Christianity goes, uh, in 1662, it pa he passed, uh, or Parliament passed, and he approved the Act of Uniformity, which required the use of the Book of Common Prayer, which was an English language liturgy, right, an order of worship that had been developed during, originally during the time of Edward VI, the son of Henry VIII. But, Puritans didn't support it. Right? So even though it's supposed to be a uniform use, not everybody was going to use it. There was also uh, attempts during this act to insist on clergy, any clergy, subscribing to Anglican doctrine. Another aspect of Charles uh, that was also concerning to many Protestants was the fact that he had been in France, a Catholic country, uh, that his mother had been French, 
And so there were always rumors and concerns about whether Charles was Catholic or not. In 1670, he signed a secret treaty with the French, um, offering that he would become Catholic if the French would help him with a war against the Dutch, which, which they did. But during the time, there's widespread anti-Catholicism in England. Uh, you know, a lot of people against Catholicism. Catholics are excluded from Parliament. You couldn't serve in Parliament if you were Catholic. He would dissolve Parliament three times. Essentially, Parliament looked at the situation. Here's Charles II. He doesn't have a child, so he's not going to have an heir. So who's his heir? Who's next in line? It's his brother James. His brother James has converted to Catholicism. So Parliament's trying to exclude James from becoming the next king. And so three times Charles II tries to exclude, or tries to get Parliament set home. Charles will convert to Catholicism, but apparently on his deathbed in 1685. Parliament, of course, was not successful, so his brother James II had become uh, king in 1685. He would go on to appoint some Catholics to prominent positions, particularly in the army. Uh, he would give rights to uh, Roman Catholics and non-Anglican Protestants. So there's that concern. People are also fearful of concern about Catholicism because Louis XIV of France had removed some of the, the protection the Huguenot, the Huguenot had, those French Protestants. So there's that concern as well. James's wife, who was Roman Catholic as well, uh, gave birth to two sons. So now there's the concern of a Catholic dynasty. Right? And so there's all these Roman Catholic fears that the British had. So Parliament declares that James has deserted his kingdom and thus abdicated in the wake of what's known as the Glorious Revolution. William, or William of Orange, who is the husband to James' daughter, Mary, who was actually the daughter of his first wife, who was Protestant. So she's Protestant. William of Orange is Protestant. They successfully throw James off the throne. James tries to flee to France, or he flees to France and lives there until his death in 1701. His son would try, and one of his sons would try to claim the throne, but is unsuccessful. Although he is recognized by the Catholic countries of Spain and France. But rule in England passes to William and Mary. Uh, they serve as joint rulers. They are both ruling in their own right. They're both monarchs. And they also agree to limits on their power, which is also what you know, makes them appealing in the eyes of Parliament. Regarding religious developments, uh, the Toleration Act is passed in 1689 giving freedom of worship rights to all non-Anglican Protestants. They're officially the church, it was the Church of England, it only recognized the Church of England, the Toleration Act now gave some freedom to what were known as dissenters or non-conformists. These were people that weren't uh, part of the Church of England but were still Protestant. They did not conform to Anglican doctrine is why they were called non-conformists. Catholics, however, still didn't have any rights. Also passed during this time was a piece of legislation that declared only Protestants could ascend to the throne. Right? And so only Protestants could ascend to the throne. <coughs> Mary died in 1694 of smallpox. Uh, William died later due to a fall while he was out riding. And so Mary's sister Anne, who was also Protestant, succeeded them. She too died without 
an heir. When, when Anne died, the closest Protestant heir was George, who was actually, if the restriction wasn't there, 52nd in line for the throne. So there were 51 Catholics that actually should have become king before George did. But because of the law that only Protestants could become monarchs, um, he was selected. George was actually an elector, elector of Hanover, meaning he, was, he lived in the Holy Roman Empire, which is essentially kind of German. So the English are turning to a German for them to, for him to be king. Um, and really, George evidently didn't really speak English. But now he's now the king of England. Another political development to kind of briefly talk about, we'll, we'll talk more about slavery uh, and its relationship to Christianity uh, in later lectures as we look at later time periods. The seafaring slave trade uh, between Africa and Europe began in 1441 when a Muslim slave, Muslim woman, was uh, brought to Portugal. During the 1500s, Portugal and Spain especially uh, forcefully transported millions of Africans to South America and the Caribbean. The first slave in North America is usually dated at 1619 in Virginia. So Europeans had been involved in the slave trade for a century or more when the slave trade began to hit its straw. Now, slave, slavery and, and trading in slaves had existed in African culture before interactions with Europeans. And so there was internal slavery in trading, and then now this development of external trading. In Europe, slaves were owned to do the work no one else would do. In Africa, uh, slaves were assigned a status, but were essentially peasant cultivators. It was more like a lord servant. Uh, type of relationship. But because of this already existing structure of slave trading, Europeans were able to really tap into it because it was already existing. Slave exports uh, exploded in the 17th century and grow even larger in the 18th century. As slaves came to the Americas, they came to work and to serve, bolstering the development of American economies. Uh, colonial society gradually transformed, especially in the southern part of North America, as the economics developed as well. As cash crops developed in the Americas, uh, things like, uh, you know, during the 17th and 18th century, uh, things like tobacco, uh, indigo, rice. Uh, these are the main things that it was discovered if we had a large workforce, especially a workforce that was enslaved, large amounts of money could be made. As slaves came in the 17th century period and into the 18th century, they brought with them their own language, philosophy, and culture. Through it all, there was a sizable group of Muslims and it's estimated anywhere from 15 to 20 percent, especially in the 18th century, uh, so the period after we're talking, uh, were Muslim. But many of those slaves would probably also have been familiar with Christianity, and there were some efforts in trying to convert African slaves in Africa before bringing them over to the Americas. But in the 17th century, there weren't too many efforts in the English colonies to try and convert African slaves in any sort of united way. That's more something that took place in the 18th century. Now, someone might ask, well, why not continue what the Spanish did? I mean, of course, it's horrible, but, but in thinking about this from the perspective of the European colonists, why not just enslave Native Americans who were already there? Well, Native American slavery didn't work out for European colonists because Native Americans had a much easier time escaping and then hiding because they knew the area 
where African slaves did not. I mean, they were taken out of their, their lands, their places, their familiar settings. Plus, of course, many Native Americans died due to European diseases, and they weren't used to the certain types of work, like, last, like Africans work. And so Native American slavery uh, was never something that really uh, became economical for these colonists. It's horrible to think about viewing somebody that way, but this is what, what it is. It's about the economics of the situation. We've already talked about how there were differences among Christians regarding the instituting of slavery. Now, we talked about Bartolome de las Casas being opposed to Native American slavery, but he does not appear to have been opposed to slavery in general, and so he's not as uh, you know, vocal against slavery, but how Native American slaves were treated. But when you think about that middle passage, that slave route by the late 16th century on, the terrible conditions, packing as many slaves as possible into the ships, um, you know, disease and death. There were people that had difficulties with that, trouble with that, and others did not. Eventually, though, you begin to see the developments of an African and slave Christianity. Much more in the 18th century, and so we'll talk more about it then. But gradually, there were concerns to try to evangelize those that had been enslaved. Questions about the politics, political developments here. 